morning, everyone. Let's stand. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all. Let's say that this morning Amen. no matter what it says through it all yeah. not just the things that you need a little help with but every single thing yeah. through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus hymn number 505 no nope. I got my numbers wrong no nope. 504. I just had my little highlight sticky in the wrong place. through 
the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountains grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my song. accomplishment this week, Cheyenne, right? Right? Cheyenne's not even shaking her head. We uh, we can't go give her a hug, we can't go shake her hand, but we can stand up and clap for her. How, how about it? And we have two visitors with us this morning, so, you know, it is kind of strange that we can't, you know, go around and everything, but after church, be sure to make them, invite them back again to our service. Hymn number 399, hymn number 399. <clears throat> Beyond the land. 
appreciate you coming and be a part of our worship service this morning. And it's our prayer, and it's been our prayer all week long, that God would just speak to each and every one of us, open up our hearts, and let Him fill our presence. Father, we thank You for the moment that we can come into this building. Lord, realize and there are concerns with each and every one. But Father, we come for a common purpose, and that is to point our eyes heavenward. And Father, to receive the words that you would have us to give. Father, for the rest of the song service, the specials, and certainly, Lord, the spoken word, we just ask that thy will be done. And Lord, we never know who will come in, and we never know the hearts. But Father, that's the job that you do so well. You know exactly where we are, physically and spiritually. And Father, you know the word that each and every one of us need. And it's our prayer that that word will be exactly what we need this day. Father, we praise you. We love you. And we thank you for those that give and support the ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. And Father, I pray that you'll bless this offering in a special, unique way. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hymn number 372. Hymn number 372, Living for Jesus.
you're determined to finish it. was a typical school day. The daughter got up that morning and her and her mom had had some words that uh, previous evening and it carried on through that morning. As most teenage girls are carrying a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety, and during that time of years, their emotions are all over the place. So the mother just asked 
her to get some chores done before she left for school. Well, that just exploded and went nowhere. As the conversation started progressing and progressing, this young lady grabbed her belongings, stormed out the door, and said this to her mother, I hate you. She got on the school bus that morning and was just very, 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 very ir irritated at her mom. And in doing so, she couldn't even think about anything else. How dare her mom ask her to do those chores and don't her mom know that she's got responsibilities and she's got all these other issues that she's confronting and she just was going over and over that in her mind. Didn't think nothing of it at the time, but they heard some emergency sirens and kids on the bus and made a derogatory statement about there's the meat wagon going and picking someone up. This young lady arrived at school and in her first period class, the principal came and stood at the door and motioned the teacher to come to the doorway. And as the principal did so, the teacher went and got this young lady and got her out into the hall. And then the principal told the young lady these words. There's been a terrible, terrible accident. At your home, you'll need to come with me. So they got her and her brother and brought her into this room. And principal sat down and with her and says that after you left for school this morning, your stepdad retrieved a firearm and killed your mother. She was telling this story at a youth camp many years ago. And she said, the last thing that I remember telling my mom was, I hate you. She said, I'll have to live with that the rest of my life. Today, hate is in vogue. Today, we think little of it when we say those words. Not too long ago, I recorded a series, and it was a series called Hate. Why do people hate? And so I started watching that and, 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 and started seeing some, seeing some things. And of course, it was, it, was, it was brought out from a secular point of view. But why do people hate? We're seeing that all over America today. And can I suggest something to you this morning? Just because a person is a, of another color gives us little or no excuse to hate someone. We are seeing things happen and I understand there are things that irritate me to no end. But I want to talk to you this morning, the very best I can, from the Scripture about the subject of hate. Because if anybody ought to have a little bit market cornered on caring one for another, it ought to be God's people. It ought to be at least us would have a little bit uh, uh, compassion. Now... We'll say some things this morning you may not totally agree with, and I understand that. But we're going to do so from from a lot of prayer and a lot of study and a lot of uh, examining my own heart. At the heart of hatred is blame. When someone feels like they have been seriously wronged or victimized by someone, their anger can carry the potential of hatred. 
Someone once said, holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal, or excuse me, holding on to hate is like grasping a hot coal, expecting someone else to get burned. Is anybody with me so far? A grandfather talking to his young grandson tells a story about two dogs inside of him struggling with each other. The first dog is one of peace, love, and kindness. And the other dog is that of fear, greed, and hatred. Which dog will win, grandfather? asked the young boy. And the grandfather replied, whichever one I feed the most. The more you hold on to hatred, the more likely it will to have an adverse effect upon you. And the more you fill it, the deadlier it becomes. So with these thoughts in mind, I'll invite your attention to Second Chronicles chapter 18 and verse number 4. Second Chronicles chapter 18 and verse number 4. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together the prophets of four hundred men and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth-Gilead to battle, or should I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it unto the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, watch this, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire at the Lord. Notice these next words. But I hate him. For he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. His name is Micaiah, the son of Imlu. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, set to, now watch this, set either of them on his throne and clothed in their robes. And they sat in a void place at the internet of the gate of Samaria. And all of the prophets prophesied before them. We'll get to that in a moment. And Zedekiah, the son of uh, Shemini made him thorns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these thou shalt push Syria uh, sh until they be consumed. And all of the prophets prophesied, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. Now watch this. For the Lord shall deliver it unto the hand of the king. Wow. Many are familiar with these verses. However, we're going to see and learn <clears throat> about King Ahab. Ahab, as you saw, had 400 advisors who basically told the king what he wanted to hear. In this case, Ahab wanted to go to war and he wanted to know from his paid staff members their opinion. So these false prophets were called in and they started putting on a show for King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat. Now, I just want you to get the, the grand picture of this. We see these two powerful men, and probably at this juncture, some of the most powerful men of the earth. And these two kings were there, and they formed an alliance, and we'll get into that a little bit later, how that came to be. And so Jehoshaphat was, a, was known as a good king, and Ahab was far from being a good king, was, was, was one of the worst kings uh, of Israel. So these two kings were going, and Ahab, uh, uh, Ahab says, Jehoshaphat says, look, if you want to go to war, I've got to know if this is going to be a safe venture. I don't want to just commit myself and commit resources, Ahab, into this war that you're planning on having. So how do I know this is going to turn out well? Come on with me. Are, are you still? Let's not pray yet. Come on with me. So these... 400 plus advisors came to King Ahab and guess what they told him? They told him exactly what he wanted to hear. Is that any, is that any great news to us? So these were on the king's payroll and guess what their main function was? Their main function was, 
Whatever the king wanted to do, whether it was good or whether it was evil, guess what they were required to say? You go ahead, Mr. King, and you go ahead and do this because, watch this, God is with you. Now, can I tell you this? Anybody can sound spiritual if they put the name God on it. We can put God on anything and make it justified if we do it. Well, God is in that, so certainly I can do this. Or, or that church has the word God in it, so it has to be right. Or that group talks about God, so they have to be right. Instead of examining in the light of Scripture. So with all of that in mind, K King Jehoshaphat heard all of these guys praising this, this venture. And he starts, get, he starts thinking a minute and he says something like this. Hey, Ahab, I'm not so sure that your guys are on the up and up. Is there someone else that we can call? You see, Jehoshaphat had an insight of what was going on. He knew that these guys were nothing but paid lackeys for King Ahab. So he says, look, just send me somebody else that, uh, that I know that can tell me the truth. Are, are, you, are, are you still with me? And so... I love this. Jehoshaphat says, watch this. Is there anybody else that's not on your payroll that you can come and, and, and you can tell me the truth? You know what Ahab says? Well, there's one guy. There's one guy out of all of my kingdom. And you know what? He never tells me what I want to hear. So guess what Jehoshaphat says? I want to hear him. I want to hear him. So that's not the best place. The best part is something like this. Here's these two kings. And you can just imagine the sparkle that these guys had. They had on their fine robes and, and they looked good and all of this. Now, we don't know this for sure because it's not, it's not stated in the Scripture. But it is kind of understated and it's this. Where was this guy, Micaiah, when they went and fetched him? Well, by all reasonable accounts, because King Ahab hated him, guess where he was? He was in prison. Come on, just giggle with me a little bit. He was in the, he was in, he was in prison. And so they says, go get him. Now I just want you to picture this scene. Here is all of these false prophets around these two gorgeous kings. They look good. They put on their deodorant, they had their aftershave on, and their robes, they automatically look very, very well. Now, wait a minute. So here comes Micaiah out of the dungeon. And by the way, prison in those days were far different than what we call prison today. So they bring this dirty, probably smelling guy up from the prison, and he looks around. Now, wait a minute. Come on. Just use your imagination. He looks around and he knows what he's supposed to say. And by the way, you know why he knows? It's because there was a messenger of Ahab that went and got him and told him this. Now, let me tell you a little bit what's going on here. We've got a delegation and Mr. Jehoshaphat is here and you would be very, very wise to tell the king what he wants to hear. Now, he's up against all of this pressure. He's up against all of the false prophets. And they're standing there. Come on, come on with me. They're standing there doing like this. And so, this true prophet of God comes up out of the prison. And I love this part. He comes up out of the prison. Now, if anybody ought to be intimidated, it ought to be this guy. Come on. It ought to be this guy because he's surrounded by people that automatically didn't like him. He's surrounded by people that he knows what he's fixing to say. It's not going to give him a long life. Amen? But it does not change him at all. Now, I want to skip down and show you this. Let's go down to verse number 14 and let me show you this. And when he was come to the king, and just imagine how he was dressed, the king said unto him, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? Now, here's where, if you don't know uh, uh, the backdrop, here's where you get confused. Now, here's what the true man of God says. Go you up and prosper, and they shall be delivered unto your hand. Now, he was saying that with scorn in his voice. Because, watch, come on. 
You know what they told him to say? Tell the king what he wants to hear. So this prophet out of the prison house comes in, probably hadn't shaved and probably didn't smell as good as these two kings. And he probably said something like this. Sure. Sure. Go up to battle. You'll be okay. You following this story? You'll be okay. Now, <laughs> I, I can just imagine. And they shall be delivered unto your hand. Here was a true prophet. Ahab had these 400 paid advisors. And now he was telling them in a mocking tone. Now, but why did King Ahab hate this prophet so much? The word hate in that verse means to be an enemy or to be a foe. So here was a man of God locked up in prison because he obviously had a long history with Ahab and long history of telling this wicked king the truth. When the king set out to do something, here was faithful Micaiah pointing his finger at the vile king and ripping the king apart. And the king, because of Micaiah's nature, could not stand having him around. He hated him, but think about this. He hated him. He just hated him. Are we guilty in our land today of having that same thing? Here's how. Because you don't tell me what I want to hear, I hate you. Because you're not on my team, I hate you. My friend, you and I better be very, very careful how we use those words. Very, very, very careful. The king was in a position that he could have done anything he wanted to with this man. I looked this up and I thought this was interesting. Ohio State Medical Center writes, Extreme emotions also trigger the release of stress hormones in our brains. When we bottle up emotions like hatred, the release of these stress hormones is continuous, which, over time, leads to an increased inflammation throughout the body and can lead to significant health consequences. So the question comes up that I wanted to know was this. How is hate different from anger? How is hate different from anger? Brother Chris, I believe there's some things on the screen. Anger is often accompanied by the thoughts of, I've been wronged. Hatred builds on the belief that since I've been wronged, others deserve to be, others deserve to suffer or to be punished. Look at the other one. Hatred is a feeling. It can cause an angry or resentful emotional response, response, which can be used against certain people or ideas. Hatred is often associated with feelings of anger, disgust, and a disposition towards the source of your hostility. So with that in mind, in our particular culture, it doesn't take much to hate. It doesn't take much to hate. As a matter of fact, watch. If you're a Christian, you need to hang on to this. If you're a Christian, we can get into that territory real easy. Whoa, 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 whoa. If we're a Christian, we can jump over to that hatred fence real, real easy. Because I want to tell you, there are some things in their land that I don't particularly think is, is godly. And there are things that's happening beyond my wildest imagination. As a matter of fact, when I look at those, you can feel the emotion building up in your... Well, come on. Come on. You can feel the emotion building up in your life. And if it wasn't for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if it wasn't for Christ, these emotions can come over us, even as believers, and say something like this, is I hate them. Now, I, I, I know, I know what you're thinking. It is very, very, very difficult to be living in a generation which we are to where we are seeing groups pitted one against another. And, 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 and I'm not trying to be ugly, but there are some people that stoke in those fires every single day. They want this race or this class hatred towards one another because somehow they believe that gets them votes. That's a shame when America has come to this. 
here we are in, in our founders, the men that gave their blood and their sweat has given us the blueprint for a successful America and a successful how things ought to be done. And for some reason now, we're saying things like this. We don't even need a constitution. We don't even need a bill of rights. We just need to go by our emotions. Guys, you better be careful when you start hearing statements like that. You better be careful about that. So here we see that hatred is, a, is, a, is, a, is an emotion. We've got to be careful. And let me continue on. Let me go back to Ahab and let me show you something that I thought was interesting. This king Ahab had everything that a man could want. He could have whatever he desired. What he could get rightfully attain, he, he, what he could not get, he simply stole it or brought it back, meaning that he could buy people of low character and low morals and convictions. But one man that he could not add to his payroll was this true prophet of God. Isn't it refreshing? Whoa, 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 come on. Isn't it refreshing today that you know that there's some men that cannot be bought? There are some men that's going to stand true regardless. Call them what you want. Defame their character. Print everything you want to about them. But these men are still in the arena. They're still fighting. And they're still holding the truth high and holy. Amen. Second Chronicles 18.7 says this. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? Well, you big baby. Can you see him having a fit there? I want him to tell me what I want to hear. But this guy, this guy only tells me the very opposite of what I want to do. Well, let, Ahab, let me give you a suggestion. It may be that you're on the wrong side. It may be that you're not thinking things through. And thank God that He has some people still in every generation that's going to point men and women to the truth. Amen. And by the way, can I tell you this before we get too deep in the woods and it's this? Beloved, I want to tell you the only hope we have is the love of Christ Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. There is absolutely, absolutely, it doesn't flow naturally from sinful human beings. And the only reason that we can even have an attempt, the only reason that we can uh, appreciate and to love people is because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. What has He done for us, my friend? Thank God He sacrificed His life. He was condemned on Calvary's cross where I don't have to be condemned on Calvary's cross. Amen? He took our place. So with that in mind, we understand that, that, that this issue is very forefront in the in 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 what we're seeing today, but the but his main thought was against this man of God that he would not prophesy good unto me. The word good there means pleasant, beautiful, or sweet. The king wanted a stamp of approval on everything that he was doing. By the way, aren't you glad? Aren't just wake up a minute. Come on, everybody, wake up. Aren't you glad that you haven't gotten everything you pray for? Aren't you glad somewhere in your life there was a Sunday school teacher, a preacher, or somebody that would counsel you and say, don't do that. Don't buy that. Don't go there because if you do that, it's going to hurt you in the long run. Oh, you threw a fit. You had a tantrum. Somebody had to calm you down. But when you thought about it, you thought, you know, he may be right. I don't need to be doing that. So thank God he has men in position that can still point people towards the cross. Amen for that. And that's what we're doing here this morning. Now, I want to read you something and it's on the screen. It's a little bit lengthy. And every time I do this, I, I challenge myself whether or not I need to do this. But I think in the where we are in this message, we need to see this. So Chris... The uh, hatred. I want you to see this and I want you to read this in your mind as we read it out loud because I, I, I think this is some of the greatest definitions I've ever seen. Hate somebody and you become a slave. He controls your thoughts, invades your dreams, 
absorbs your creativity and determines your appetite. He affects your digestion, robs you of your peace of mind, and takes the pleasure out of your work. He ruins your religion and hounds you wherever you go. You cannot get away from the man you hate. He is with you when you awake, and He invades your privacy when you eat. He is close beside you while you drive your car. He affects your attitude on the job and distracts your mind so that you can have neither efficiency or happiness. He influences even the tone of your voice when you speak to your boss, your wife, or your child. Watch. Watch this. He requires you to take medicine for your indigestion, headaches, and loss of energy. He steals your moments of consciousness before you go to sleep. If you want to be a slave to somebody, find some person to hate. So we see King Ahab here having this deep hatred for this true prophet of God. Why did he hate him so bad? It's not because Micaiah did anything wrong other than telling the king, you're not doing right. You're not doing right. And can I tell you this? Truth is on trial today, if you don't know that. Truth is on trial. Nobody wants to hear absolute, ungarnished truth. Because everybody has a desire now to do what they want to do. It's just like the Old Testament says, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And see, this is the culture in which we're kind of getting back to. Preacher, don't tell me what to do. You don't have any right to tell me what to do. All right, that's fine. I'll just, I'll just leave that up to God because He's a greater, He's a greater judge than I'll ever be. Amen about that. Let's just leave that up to Him. But can I tell you this? It is our job to point us in the right way. And what is the right way? The right way is through Christ Jesus. Now, let me very, finish this up very quickly. This story of Micaiah reminds me of another brave soul who is up against this same king on a mountainside. This same hated king, this, this king that had hatred in his life for a long time, it manifested itself in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 17. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 17. And it came to pass that when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. You have followed Balaam, now therefore sin and gather to me uh, all Israel into the Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets in the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. Now, we understand that I, Elijah was outnumbered by a human perspective, just like the prophet Micaiah. But these men refused to bow down to this evil king. It had to be rather intimidating to see all of those that was lined up against you. And friend, this is what I want to encourage our church with this morning. Listen to the preacher. As the days get longer, and as Jesus tarries His, his coming there's going to be greater and greater lines in opposition to our church. There's going to be greater and greater lines in opposition to you and what you stand for. And we already know that. Because Jesus made a statement when He was here. If they persecute, persecuted the prophets, and He basically said, in me, what makes you think they're not going to come after you? So we know that. We, we know that we're going to be in a long line of people that's going to be persecuted or, or, or things are going to come our way that we never anticipated. We never anticipated several months ago that the churches of America would be closed. Who would have ever foresaw that coming? Who would have ever foresaw that? And we understand there, there's some, there's some churches that's even close to us that's still not even open to this day. There's some people that's making these edicts and these laws or these, or, 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 or these directives that are telling the churches that you cannot open. I thought this was funny this week. Some of you saw this. Once church says, you, you, you tell me that I can't open in my building. So that church went to Walmart and started singing praises to the Lord. Isn't that pretty good? We, 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 we can't have services in our church, but we can go to Walmart. So let's just have church at Walmart. Hey Amen. That's pretty good. That's pretty creative, I thought. Praise the Lord for that pastor. Had the guts to do that. So they did show, 
they did show this church singing and praising and, 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 and having a good time. People with their cameras and photos and all, all this stuff. So I thought, my goodness, there are some people that still have some initiative left in them. Let me just close by sharing this with you. Nobody, nobody in their right minds would ever invite trouble. I don't think the prophet Micaiah stood back and says, I hope the king really comes at me today. I really, really want to be a thorn in his flesh. He probably didn't ask for that, but what he did know was this. But no matter what the king does to me, I'm going to stand for right. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to bow to political pressure. And by the way, can I tell you, it would have been easy for him to do so. But aren't you glad that that guy just stood straight in the face of the most powerful man on earth and says, King, you have no hope if you go to that battle. You have no hope if you continue on the progress and the track that you're on now. And the same thing that we need to end this service with this morning. My friend, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you have really no hope. There is nothing left in your life if you have not a relationship with Christ. You are missing some of the greatest moments of mankind. A relationship with that Savior that wants to love you, wants to abide with you. And you know the good thing about it is every single day I have the privilege of getting into the throne room of glory and spending a few moments with the King of all kings. And my friend, you have that same, same option today, today as, as I do. But it might take a little bit of courage. It might take some courage for somebody to admit that they are in need of a Savior. Uh, you, you, you've never made that commitment to Christ. You, you've sat through hundreds of services. You've sat through Bible studies and messages and revivals and everything. But you've never come to that conclusion that Christ is your personal Savior. Today would be a good day to do that. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, I know we talked about a difficult subject. And Lord, we saw it play out in, in, in King Ahab's life, not as he just got older, but he was infested with this as a, as a, as a young man. He had this issue of his heart of despising the things that are good. Those that love the Lord, He opposed. I wonder if there would be that one person in this room that could honestly say, Preacher, I, I don't want to admit it, but there are some issues that's floating around in my life that, that sure needs to be addressed. And it certainly may not even be hatred. It could be something that you're dealing with on a personal level. We come to a service like this each and every Lord's Day and we always know that this is a time of decision. This is a time for you to do something and get your heart right and in tune with God. Before we ask Brother Randy to sing, here's the question that I want to lay upon your heart. Is everything in your mind and your life right with God this morning? Are you doing the right things? You're thinking the right things? You're saying the right things? Do you know that God is your Savior? Do you know that He directs you and guides you and leads you each and every day? Or is there something in the back of your mind that says, Preacher, I just don't have that peace that other Christians have? I would love to talk to you about that this morning if you'd come. We certainly would make fun of you. We'd just show you what the Scripture has to say. Brother Randy will sing this invitation as you stand quietly. And we'll offer you this time to do something with Christ. Brother Randy, would you sing this first verse for us? This is your moment.